This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to answer the question, was Bitcoin fairly distributed? I think this is gonna be an increasingly used vector of attack, saying that Bitcoiners got lucky, Bitcoiners don't deserve their wealth, early Bitcoiners did nothing and still got rich. And this unfortunately inevitably leads status to conclude, ergo the state should seize their Bitcoin or at least try to seize their Bitcoin, good luck with that, and keep it or redistribute it. So here's my own story and my encounter with Bitcoin's early distribution. I first heard about Bitcoin from a friend in tw about 2011 when it was trading for about a dollar per Bitcoin. I told my friend that I could probably allocate something like $10,000 to Bitcoin, but I wasn't sure that it would move the needle on my net worth enough to make it worthwhile. That was a terrible, terrible decision. That 10,000 Bitcoin that I could have bought is today worth about $410 million. I was completely wrong. Unfortunately, I didn't start stacking and hodling until late 2019. There's a saying that everyone gets Bitcoin at the price that they deserve. My deserved price was obviously somewhere in the five figures. And I comfort myself by telling myself that there's really no way that I would have hodled 10,000 Bitcoin all the way up to the present in 2023. I would probably have sold all of them when Bitcoin hit $10 or $100 or $200 and thought that I was an investing genius turning $10,000 into that amount of money. Or I somehow would have lost those Bitcoin on Mt. Gox or somehow messed up my private keys. So Bitcoin's distribution was clearly not fair to me, at least at a very surface level. Even though I was a financially sophisticated individual with a hedge fund background, I did not get Bitcoin. I didn't understand it and I did not buy it in the early days in spite of the fact that I lived in Silicon Valley and had heard people talking about it. It could be that Satoshi didn't want arrogant hedgies like me becoming the predominant early holders of Bitcoin. And I think in this case, it worked out well for the protocol. Now, everyone has a Bitcoin story. For example, when did you first hear about Bitcoin? I would guess, especially if you're in a developed nation, it was probably at least five years ago or more. Did you buy any? You didn't buy any? Well, that's actually on you. Did you even bother to do any research? I certainly didn't. Or did you just write it off as a scam or a waste of time like I did? Or even worse, did you post negative comments about Bitcoin online or badmouth it when you hadn't even bothered to spend 30 minutes understanding how it worked? Well, you couldn't even tell anyone what a proof of work was or what a blockchain was, etc. And yet you were online making negative comments as I was doing in real life. So if so, like me, who did some similar things, you actually did not deserve any Bitcoin at that price five years ago or whenever you first heard about it. In fact, I confidently told many people that it was a bubble, Bitcoin was a scam, many times before I bothered investigating even the basics of it. And by doing so, I hurt both myself and contributed to other people missing out. And most people in developed countries at least first heard about Bitcoin many years ago and could have bought some, but they didn't. I didn't. And now some of them go around telling everyone that the distribution wasn't fair. And I think what's actually not fair is this kind of accusation, which is driven mostly by envy and regret. If you're enjoying this video so far and would like to help out the channel, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button. That really helps this channel's reach. Hit the like button, leave a comment, question, suggestion, topic for a future video. Also share this video with a friend or family member that you think might find it helpful. So let's imagine, let's say that Satoshi, Satoshi did not do a very good job. Let's imagine a better alternate launch scenario for Bitcoin. Let's imagine that in January 2009, which is when Satoshi mined the Genesis block, let's Im imagine that Satoshi had instead chosen to airdrop equal amounts of Bitcoin to every single human being on the planet in 2009, which was about 6.8, 6.9 billion people. Let's say he had a database and he had the names of everyone. He had some way of getting them the Bitcoin. And let's just assume for the sake of argument that there was actually a way to do this. When you actually think of the logistics, it becomes incredibly complicated. Here's an extra credit advance point on this topic. It's unlikely that miners would have been willing to secure the network without a block subsidy, that initial 50 Bitcoin, which has been halved and halved down to 6.25 Bitcoin. The miners would have been unwilling to secure the network without a block subsidy because almost nobody would be willing to pay transaction fees on a new and novel network and they probably wouldn't even know how to send transactions. So this was another reason that it was very good that Satoshi incorporated the block subsidy. But let's just assume for the sake of this argument that there was this global airdrop of equal amounts of Bitcoin to every single human being on the planet, the ultimate fair launch, you might say, or would it have really been fair? So let's roll the film forward and imagine what would have happened. Here's what I think would have happened. The vast majority of people would probably have lost their coins or sold their coins for a few bucks to people who actually understood 
the importance of the technology. And the net result would be something similar to what we got anyway from Satoshi's actual distribution schedule, the net result of people losing their coins and selling their coins to people who actually valued them. The net result would be a bunch of Bitcoin whales who are fairly smart, probably fairly libertarian, fairly technical, and had done their research into the protocol and read the white paper, etc. Here's the reality. There's really no way to hodl Bitcoin without extremely strong conviction, and especially if you got it for free, it's unlikely that you would value it very highly. When we get stuff for free, we rarely value it highly. There's also no way, there's no way to hodl Bitcoin without extremely strong conviction, and there's no way to airdrop strong conviction. You can airdrop the coins, but you cannot airdrop the conviction. That conviction is earned and attained through proof of work, through doing the research and spending a lot of time thinking about these things from first principles. So buying Bitcoin is actually the easy part. Hodling it is the difficult part. And if you've been hodling over the past two years, you know how painful and how painful it can be. Here's how people think it's like to hodl, and this is what it's actually like to hodl. I love that meme. Hodling is extremely difficult. You have to constantly suffer through negative headlines and endless, endless FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt from the mainstream media and elsewhere. And you also have to suffer having close friends and family make fun of you for years and years, as has happened to me and has happened to many of you. You also have to successfully hold your own private keys and not lose your Bitcoin by leaving it on Celsius, BlockFi, FTX. You have to also not make bad decisions, a single bad decision could end it all for your Bitcoin. You also have to try to understand what you own in order to build conviction. This is the only way you'll be able to hodl. How many people even today have taken the time to sit down in a quiet room for 30 minutes and actually sit down and read Satoshi's white paper? People somehow have time to watch all of Downton Abbey, Stranger Things, The Crown, and Suits, and these are great shows, but they somehow cannot find the time to read a nine-page PDF and watch a few YouTube explainers. These are the people who should not be complaining about Bitcoin's distribution because they're not willing to put in the work. Is it actually unfair that these people did not buy Bitcoin when they could have because they were too busy watching Netflix instead? I think there's a long history of people not appreciating or not being able to hold on to a valuable asset because they're poor or because they are just too busy. They have so many things going on in their lives. For example, this article claims that most Salvadorans have already ditched their Bitcoin wallets. They've either just not accessed them or they've given away or sold off or spent the Bitcoin. Something similar happened in the Soviet Union after it collapsed. You had all these state-owned enterprises and there was this idea of distributing them to the public, distributing ownership in them through something called voucher privatization. And from this Wikipedia article, voucher privatization took place between 1992 and 1994, and roughly 98% of the population participated. The vouchers, each corresponding to a share in the national wealth, were distributed equally among the population, including miners. So this was a completely fair distribution. They could be exchanged for shares in the enterprise to be privatized. Because most people were not well informed about the nature of the program or were very poor, they were quick to sell their vouchers for money, unprepared or unwilling to invest. Most vouchers, and hence most shares, wound up being acquired by the management of the enterprises. And this is really what gave birth to the oligarchs as well, who were able to accumulate all this paper and take over these companies. So here is a completely fair distribution that ended in a similar way to what I imagine a fair and equal distribution of Bitcoin would have ended, where you'd still have a lot of people getting rid of it, and then it would be concentrated in a few strong hands. And again, none of this is to blame Russians or Salvadorans for selling their vouchers or Bitcoin to buy food, shelter, firewood, medical care, etc. But if you're going to criticize Bitcoin's distribution, you should also be criticizing the world's unfair distribution of genes, water, arable land, war zones, climate, etc. Here's another thing to remember. Bitcoin had zero monetary value from January 2009, really until May 2010. And even then it didn't have widespread value. But May 2010 was when Laszlo paid Jeremy Sturdivant 10,000 Bitcoin for two Papa John's pizzas. So Bitcoin, unlike all the other cryptocurrencies, entered the world with zero monetary value and had to slowly go through a process of spontaneous monetization. And this is one of the huge things that makes Bitcoin very, very special. This hasn't happened with any other cryptocurrency. Contrast that with altcoins with their pre-mines, which are huge insider initial allocations and these altcoins having initial value. For example, in the Ethereum sale, you had to exchange Bitcoin, which had real monetary value for 
ETH. Nothing like this happened with Bitcoin. Instead, a bunch of math and computer nerds fell in love with Bitcoin for its properties and for its surrounding ideology, and then ended up accidentally getting rich, the ones who were able to hold on and figure out how to hold on. Even Satoshi, he mined Bitcoin in order to secure the network. He didn't mine it to get rich. He may have earned about a million coins in doing this, but he's never profited financially from it. He walked away, never moved or sold those coins. And you can contrast this with people like Ethereum insider Vitalik Buterin, who printed up his own money and then dumped it on retail investors for gain. He's admitted openly that he sold at least 25% of his Ethereum holdings. If we take a look at this chart of initial token allocations for public blockchains, you can look at your favorite product and see how much the insiders got ahead of you and were able to dump on you this pink or red uh, part of the, the circle, part of the pie, shows you how large the pre-mine was and what insiders were given. So these are highly, highly unfair distributions and anyone who participates in any of these projects should not be criticizing Bitcoin. And if they are criticizing Bitcoin, it's because they want to dump on you. They want to dump their pre-mined coins on you instead of you buying Bitcoin. Was Bitcoin fairly distributed? Here's a different, more counterintuitive answer to the question. Bitcoin was actually never distributed. Bitcoin is a voluntary system. So the question of whether Bitcoin had a fair distribution doesn't even make sense because there was no centralized distributor in charge of distribution. Anyone could plug into the network and bind Bitcoin. Anyone could exchange their fiat or goods and services for Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is a voluntary system, it might not even make sense to talk about Bitcoin's distribution. So what's the conclusion to all of this? Today, Bitcoin is not equally distributed in the sense that 8 billion people on earth do not own equal amounts of it. But then again, nothing is equally distributed on this planet. Bitcoin was not is not equally distributed today, but it was and has been as fairly distributed as one could hope, as we can conclude from the various thought experiments that we've engaged in in this video. And I'd say that most of the people who criticize Bitcoin's distribution are Marxists or Marxist sympathizer or other forms of status. They believe in the violent redistribution of wealth at the barrel of a gun, as well as their inherent right to a large share of that redistributed wealth. Fortunately, Bitcoin resists redistribution. You can be stupid or unlucky and lose your Bitcoin, but no one can take your Bitcoin from you if you do things properly and hold your own private keys. People can kill you, but they still won't get your Bitcoin if the knowledge of your private keys dies with you. And here's some good news. We're all still very, very early to Bitcoin. Bitcoin at $40,000, $41,000 per coin is still extremely cheap. And since it's going into the millions and eventually the billions of dollars per coin in purchasing power in the coming years, everyone should be doing everything in their power to provide goods and services to the world in order to earn more Bitcoin or more fiat that can be converted into Bitcoin rather than sitting in the corner like some resentful academic claiming that the initial distribution wasn't fair, especially when that academic sitting there with tenure. This is how losers act when confronted with opportunity. As I'm recording this, you can still exchange $41,000 of dirty fiat US dollar war money for a Bitcoin. And fortunately as well, each Bitcoin is made up of 100 million sats or satoshis. So you don't even need to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy five, 10, $20 worth of Bitcoin. So the distribution of Bitcoin, it's really important to remember as well. It's an ongoing process and it's up to you today. Today is the time how much you want to participate in that process. Bitcoin is a voluntary system. You can choose to opt in to the extent that you want to, or you can choose to remain outside of the system to your own personal detriment, as many people still are choosing to do. And so in this way, Bitcoin is a much more ethical system than fiat. It's never imposed on anyone. Fiat, by contrast, is imposed on you by the threat of police or soldiers putting you in a cage. Bitcoin, by contrast, is ethical, honest, voluntary money for 8 billion people. And today is your best chance to participate in its further distribution. So make sure you look forward instead of looking towards the past. Think of where Bitcoin's going, think of its construction, think of its soundness and its ethicalness, and then decide whether you want to participate in the system further. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.